Good morning, everybody. My name is Lance McCann, and this is the show, Stockton United. My guest today is Benjamin Saffold. He's a local community builder. Welcome to the show, Benjamin. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> Thank you. I see you all over Facebook, so I figured I might as well have you on and <laughs> see, see what you do. Pull me out of the virtual world into <laughs> yeah, the real. Exactly. We all have those friends that we're, we're friends with on Facebook, and then when you run into somebody, you're like, you look familiar. Yeah, like, I'm no. that guy. Yeah. Me yeah. too. I had that happen at Target the other day. It was pretty funny. But I have an identical twin brother, so when people say, hey, you look familiar for me, it always goes back, I have a twin brother. Right. Yeah. And is it good or bad? It's usually good. Did I beat you up? Then that's probably my twin brother. <laughs> it was, when it was bad is when he was doing repos <laughs> about six years ago. Right. People like look at me, I'm like, uh, did my brother repo your car? But it's all good. <laughs> so before we dive into... Sure. You as a community builder, let's yeah. forget a little bit background about Benjamin and what you, who you are and what you do, and, and then we'll dive into community building and see what we could do to fix Stockton's aches and pains. We're going to start easy, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, from North Stockton, born and raised, as the saying goes, the song goes, uh, born and raised in Stockton. Okay. Uh, didn't really connect much to Stockton. I was going to school and doing my thing, and uh, it was only until I left Stockton, I moved to Sacramento for 12 years. And uh, when I left Stockton, I kind of got a perspective from the outsider, even though it wasn't that far away. And uh, I left because of a job opportunity, and I actually came back because of another job opportunity. Nice. And but this time when I came back, I came back with like, what can I do to make an impact in the place I was born and raised? And um, with that came Opportunities. I began to just, you know, what most people do that when they either go away to college or come back, they join all the committees and the boards and <laughs> service clubs. Which is important. I, I, yeah. Whether you go away and then come back, I think it's important. I've recently just started getting involved in my community and trying to develop my children into being yeah. thought leaders. Right. My theory is I'm not raising my children, I'm developing them. So being a role model to them given something back to the community whether it's one day a month mm -hmm. a couple times a year but something you you have to uh, i don't know if it's a karma thing or, mm -hmm. or just a being a good person but, yeah but you have to do something to give back to the community. you usually have to get to the point where you get past yourself <laughs> yeah and for me it took leaving town pursuing my own dreams and goals and then looking back from that perspective and somehow uh, you know, because of me growing in my faith, growing as a person, I began to see Stockton with fresh eyes. And then the next question was, uh, what part can I play in that? Hmm. And I came back to Stockton in 2007. Were you overwhelmed? Like, no, it was all it was all new. So it was like learning. I love to learn about okay. things. I have a you know I have a background in uh, the music industry. So I was the kind of guy who bought a CD and list, and read all the who played the guitar, who played oh, the really? bass, you were that guy? who engineered. Yeah, I was that guy. <laughs> I'm like reading the, the booklet as I'm reading, opening a CD for the reading first time. Reading the lyrics if they have yeah. them. Yeah. bummed out if they didn't have the lyrics. I was like, oh, that's the guy that played on this, and that's the guy that produced that. And I would make all those connections. Oh. So I really enjoyed learning about, okay, how is the power structure in Stockton set up? Where are the people that congregate that are in the arts community? Hmm. in the uh, business community, in the government community, and learning about all where everything is set up that way, and then most importantly, finding out what part I can play. And it, it could be overwhelming, but I was always focused. I think a lot of people want to do something, but they just don't know where to start. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it, it's kind of backwards. I think what helped me, and I think what helped a lot of people, is finding out what you're, discovering what your passions are. Discovering who you are. Mm -hmm. What do you like? And I would never there, forget when I was there's in... There's always an organization to support what you like. There is, and it's always asking the right questions. I'll never forget when I went to uh, my first year in junior college, I went to the guidance counselor, and the counselors asked me, what are you passionate about? Like, and um, he, and he, he, just, <laughs> he heard me talk for half an hour about different stuff, and he goes, okay, I think you should pursue this way. You should pursue communications, broadcasting, journalism speech and when I got on that course it led me to going to Delta College and getting involved in a radio station writing for the school paper 
uh, working in the TV production. And with that, I got an internship at Channel 3. Oh, wow. And it kept adding on. I got involved with, um, you know, getting involved in, in radio stations locally. And everything now that I do that I've done in the last 10 years has been a culmination of utilizing all of those things I pursued individually. So one thing you'll discover is if you pursue your passions, not only will you learn about those passions, but then you'll learn about the part they play and what's ahead for you. Interesting. Yeah, I went the, I went the yeah, messy yeah. way. I just, I, it, <laughs> it took key people to hear me spill my guts about what I'm passionate about, redirect those things, Decide redirect me, to do. yeah, like, hey, and give me a direction. Way. And then one step always led to the other. And uh, to me, I'm the kind of person I have to be fulfilled and happy in what I do and find joy in what I do. Absolutely, because it... it so I'm follow the joy, I guess. Yeah, I've gone to jobs really that way. I've had to do, yeah. and it's just miserable. Yeah. But if you enjoy your job or whatever it is you're enjoying, it makes it easier to deal with the bad days that come. Yeah. So I come from it. You know, my father was a blue-collar worker. Um, and so when I would tell him I'm leaving a job because I wasn't happy... Those weren't good days in my house. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I can imagine. So your dad sounds a lot like. My yeah, dad. I mean, most <laughs> most most you know, dads are like you know, it's, it's a certain standard of you know, based on income and, and things that will bring you mm -hmm. material things. But uh, fortunately, they uh, always wanted the best for us, right? You know, in, but... in in their own way, and so I appreciate. I understand him now, and it's funny thinking about how he heard what I said back then. Now, yeah. I feel sorry for him now. It's like, oh, Dad, I didn't know what I put you through. Like, yeah. I yeah. hear myself through your ears now. I have a 16-year-old so I, and a 13-year-old girl, and I'm just like, man. Yeah. Um, I got I got my work cut out for them. I'm trying to get them going. I've had them read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, How to Win Friends and Influence People, mm -hmm. and just trying to get them well-rounded for what lies ahead. Yeah. I'm not a dad, but I, I do mentor, but I think uh, one thing parents <clears throat> should do or could easier. do, it's, yeah. Because well, <laughs> then you get to go It's home. almost like it's almost like, a, like a grandparent. <laughs> yeah. you know, grandparents love it because they get to spoil their grandkids and send them back <laughs> yeah. and exact revenge on their kids. <laughs> yeah. uh, but really, it's setting your kids in front of things. You know, if, if they have an affinity for music, set them in front of a piano. Set them in front of an instrument. Mm -hmm. and see what happens. We were talking about... Um, Cartoons uh, before we came on the air. Yeah, the good old and days. And I love, you know, uh, Looney Tunes cartoons. And I remember when I worked at Tower Records, I didn't know nothing about classical music. And I went to the guy who ordered classical music. I said, I know nothing about classical music. So I'm going to, I need your permission to reveal my ignorance. <laughs> he goes, Tell me best you can what you like. I said, All I can tell you is I like the songs that are played in the background of Bugs Bunny cartoons. Mm. He goes, okay, you should try with Tchaikovsky. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I started buying CDs like uh, Idiot's Guide to Classical Music and you know, Music for Dummies and whatnot. I, and that's I, I took a music class, and the, the music teacher, she was playing Looney Tunes, and some of the most famous classical there songs are in Looney Tunes. Absolutely. I had no idea Absolutely. that I was listening to a, a famous song. From Looney Tunes, his song is famous, but it was not part of my world. Yeah, my I, my mom liked country music, and my dad liked classic rock. And there's a CD that if you go to, I'm sure, a uh, used record store, a uh, used music store, it's called Idiot's Guide to Classical Music, and in it it has 40 minute, 40 second snippets of mm. songs, and then in the booklet it says what you would know it from, and sometimes it's a commercial, sometimes it's a movie. Oh wow. And so, you, like I said, if you can start, if you can know where to strategically show your ignorance and share it with someone who can help you, That's I've found cool. it worked well for me. So I've always been telling off of myself, tell me what I need to know. <laughs> Find someone who knows what I want to know mm -hmm. and get the information from them and then take it to the next level. Sweet. Well, let's dive into community builder. Sure. So there's so many different facets of what a community builder is. Mm -hmm. Some some are negative connotations, yeah. some aren't. Yeah. So what is your perspective? What are your key points for a community builder? What's that look like well, in, I, in your world? It uh, This is a combination of 10 years of working in, again, with service clubs and nonprofits. Um, and I had to define for myself the terms that I have and be able to communicate those to people to build a common language. I like that. Because sometimes you can be in a room full of people, and you can say the things that are like all nodding. Yeah, that sounds great. Sound, unity? Yeah, it sounds great. Coming together? Yeah, it sounds great. Absolutely. But when you come to what it costs and what 
brass tacks are when it comes to that, that's where you have the division that eventually comes. So you have to be able to articulate not only the words, but to actually define them and then use them in a term that can build consensus. Because a lot of times in political debates or whatever mm -hmm. that your passion is, the, the passion is overwhelmed with emotion. Yeah. And when you get emotional, then the logic is out the window and it's hard to have a logical conversation with somebody when they're so emotionally charged yeah. about something. Yeah. I had an incident yes, yesterday that, you know, this group was so emotionally charged about this dog, yeah. it was an actual dog, that the logic went out the window yeah. and we're trying to help. It just was just a snowball and finally it's just like, you, you can't work, it doesn't work. When you have so many people buying, it, throwing daggers at you, you just have to say, okay. It's difficult to discern the, the agendas. And I think that you start with the fact that everybody has an agenda. Mm -hmm. Whether they say it or not, or able to articulate it or not, they have an agenda. It's human nature to always operate in your own best interest. Yeah. And then secondly, learn how to articulate that agenda and learn how to, to even defend and debate that, but learn to, to build consensus. Uh, some of some listeners may remember years ago uh, there was a movement called Occupy. Occupy yes. stop. Who doesn't remember that? <laughs> and um, I came to a meeting. I didn't come to join. I came to give advice. And that's part of what we're talking about right. now is coming, whether you're a part of something or not, wanting to make something better as a result of you being a part of it. And I told him, I said, my advice here, and I won't be coming back, but my advice is to find three things that you can say that are your values, that you can tell people about when you recruit, when you're being, you know, when there's your microphone in front of you. Have a unified message. Unified message outside. You can, you can work on your differences inside, your group. But when it comes to outside, having uh, common values that you all can articulate, that you all agree upon. And everybody has that. We all, as, as, as on law of averages, any given person, you, me, anybody, there is more that we have in common than we have differences. I agree. But what we will do is we will magnify the differences to qualify for us being doing anything together. Enemies or... Like, for example, you, you and I have a great conversation. Let's say you are a Republican and I'm a Democrat. Okay. When you discover, as a Republican, I'm a Democrat, oh, I, I, hate I don't you. know. I can't I, be look at the time. We've got to go now. Uh, see, you, see you next you time. Do. Yeah. So those kind of things are, are we have to be able to navigate through those. And again, after 10 years and, and a one-year sabbatical of reflection, um, I've discovered that, you know, unity is not only recognizing um, similarities, it's actually respecting differences. True. Terry posted something. She, uh, people um, get emotionally when they're, they're really passionate about something. Yeah. Um, hey, Terry. <laughs> Uh, she's a really cool person. She uh, lives in Woodbridge, and she has a construction company. She helps with animal rescue, and, and I'm a part of that. Um, so how do you, when somebody's so emotionally charged and passionate about something, how do you kind of simmer down the, the emotion to have the logic kick in and try to work to resolve as a united front? How yeah. do you do that? This is when you pull another tool off the tool belt. <laughs> this not, one's, not a hammer, right? This, no, this is an a, a interpersonal tool. Okay. And it's called active listening. Okay. Uh, anybody who is, uh, like, I come from a family who loves to have spirited discussions, you know, on different topics. Yeah, can imagine. Yeah, and so, uh, but I was always, I was the youngest in my family, so I'm always the one listening for, like, a long time, and then I would maybe once every few months would say something. And what I learned from that is, number one, what is the most least in a conversation, when you talk the least, your words become more valuable to those who are listening. Mm. If someone's talking, another person's talking back and forth, there's not much value involved because all you're trying to do is talk over. I used to be the kind of person who wait would talk. wait wait for you to come for a breath and I'd you know, dive back in <laughs> do there. Do you wait to talk or do you listen? I listen. listen. Again, <laughs> active listening means yeah. I'm going to be the first one to stop talking. Okay. And I'm going to listen to what you have to say, and I'm going to actually repeat it back to you. By the way, this is good for uh, men in general. 
dealing with uh, <laughs> with uh, <laughs> spousal opposite arguments. sex issues. <laughs> um, active listening, the the ability to repeat what you s- another person says is powerful. very very powerful. Um, and 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 communicate that you understand. And then give them the opportunity to listen as well. And they're more apt to listen to a listener. Okay. So that's one Note, of the tools. Noted. I'm going to put that one in here. Telling you. Again, not only in community draw. building, but in relationship building <laughs> in general. <laughs> Terry does. Uh, yeah, it will, it, will, um, it will serve you well in right. any kind of building. Maybe Mr. Brown could should watch this part of the episode. I, I went, and you don't say names. You let whoever whoever is listening and, and it resonates with you, let it resonate with you. There you go. I love that. That's good. I mean, you learn something new every day. That's what I love Absolutely. about the show. That's the whole purpose is to dive in and, and extract different yeah. key, key points. And it helps build, build you up as a person as the day goes along. And again, I, I'm going to probably keep coming back to this, but learning yourself. Uh, nothing, if you're confident in who you are, you're not diminished by being a part of another group. Mm-hmm. If you feel like your goal is to win everybody over to your side, um, as opposed to building consensus and listening to say where there's common ground, it can be self defeating <clears throat> Yeah, this is a political climate. is pretty crazy right now with the, I mean... People are fighting. Families are fighting. It's crazy. So, I just keep my peace to myself. Generally. Well, I, I I do, but also I've learned how to express myself and express my point of view uh, on social media. So you don't have a megaphone. You need to listen. To me. Again, when your words are few, they, they increase in value. Think about it. If if everybody had gold, they would have no value. True. If everybody had silver or diamonds, it would. It's it's the rarity that makes it more valuable. If you're a few words, you know, I'm a Christian, and so I, I study the Bible, and the Bible says, be quick to listen, slow to speak. That's the message today, everybody. And my favorite, <laughs> there's, a, there's a book in the Bible called Proverbs, my favorite one, and it helps me a great deal. It says, even a fool seems wise when he holds his tongue. <laughs> Uh, that's good and I'm like I can now be smarter than I am just by not saying something or not responding you you can't you just keep your mouth shut and you won't prove to everybody that they they already think you're a fool there's a I think in in law there's like uh, they say don't never ask a question you don't know the answer to Mm -hmm. and someone may think you're a fool but don't speak open your mouth and prove it or something there you go always those sayings like that I love that one yeah I'm going to that, teach that to my son. <laughs> he opens his mouth sometimes like, what? Yeah, it's like, well. Yeah, he's a 16-year-old, but he's, he's a good kid overall. Uh, so what are, what are you, going back to the community mm-hmm. builder, what are yeah. your key elements? You have like, because you said there's those three things. Yes. Um, Find out what but, you have in common. What, is your, what are your five things that you think, or four things, or three things that you think are important for the community? What I personally think, and I, just for those who are watching, if you're on uh, Facebook right now, um, I started a new page called One City Stockton, and I believe it's at One City Stockton as one word. Uh, and I actually posted my first blog uh, through Blogspot, and basically it's it starts it's going to start a conversation that I hope with even with you and others that will lead to something offline. And I think that's the biggest thing I've been trying to do for the last few years is taking the heated discussions or spirited discussions online, offline. And I've had uh, great success on very limited measures with, you know, 10 or 12 folks. And I'd like to build that to a, a bigger consensus. But I think when it comes to Stockton, and I've in the last 10 years, I've been meeting with city staff and those who are involved in service clubs and nonprofits and it seems like the five things that everybody would agree that we need to focus on when it comes to making Stockton better is in the area of safety. Absolutely. Area of education. Area of employment. Employment means, yeah. Area of health. That could be anything from diet to movement to obesity and whatnot. And then that to community building. I think uh, a lot of our challenges, uh, whether it's violence prevention, whether it's homelessness, uh, I'm sorry, housing is uh, one of the five as well. Uh, and those things are not only the greatest assets and opportunities, those are also the greatest drains on our tax dollars. Absolutely. Um, somebody coined the t- phrase bedroom t- for the Bay Area. Yeah. We are the bedroom. I mean, people, 
we all know somebody or multiple people of our friends who drive to the Bay Area three hours, four hours a day in commute traffic just to go to work. Yeah. Now, this is a perfect example of what I like to have a discussion with you about because as someone who loves Stockton and passionate about Stockton like you are, I'd like to change the narrative and the discussion on Stockton to not focus as a first priority being a bedroom community. And as a first priority, think about housing those who actually live here. There is a mindset that really can be a distraction to focus on people that we want to come here at the neglect of people that already are here. I agree. And so part of that is some of the people who are homeless right now are because Bay Area people have pushed here, pushed rents up. And so now those people Mm -hmm. are homeless because they can't afford the rent no okay. more. And there are people that have been here and live here. 20 plus years. Went to school here, graduated here, and are having a hard time finding a place to live. And Because the Bay Area is honoring the vouchers in San Joaquin County. Well, That's the crazy part to me. Like we were, we were, talking, we were talking last night on the phone, I was talking about the complexities. Every issue, housing is, a, is in its own a complex issue. It's very That complex. requires a really a detailed discussion and there are a lot of things that people don't know but they go into a topic and want to have a discussion you talk about people being shipped here um, there are s cities around Northern California that send people here with a one-way ticket to Stockton absolutely I think we, there should be a lawsuit against those cities and or they can send some money here this way or this is, there's different ways to to address that so and also we are a county seat uh, which basically means we're the capital of San Joaquin County. So okay. a lot of the services for the whole county are mm, here. Okay, that makes sense. So someone could say, I'm going to send them there because, you know, human services is there or, you know, a county agency is there for them. So um, we've got to kind of divide the responsibility between what is a city responsibility and also what is a county responsibility. That makes sense. And the, so the problem with yeah. the, the homelessness um, I had Nancy Lamb on my show, mm -hmm. it, is if you figure out the problem, you solve it, then everybody else is like, oh, Stockton's got it. They got it figured out. Here, we'll just send them there. Okay. So it exacerbates the problem we already have. We can't take care of what we have. Unless our mission as a city is to solve problems in a way that are a template for other cities to duplicate. And that's what she was saying. Modesto has like... Uh, they centralize the homeless people. Mm -hmm. So outreach, sanitation, they could all go there to one place instead of being spread out. Uh, I was just talking with somebody yesterday. They're doing the, the homeless count. Yeah. So yeah. two days or three days before the homeless count actually happened, the city has gone in and put removed some of these homeless camps. So mm -hmm. now they're... Now they're spread out across the Stockton. We don't know where they are. Right. If they would have just waited three days, we could have gotten money to help relieve that problem. That's true in a way and true not in a way. And, and with all due respect to those who are participating in the homeless count, um, you got to keep in mind that some people are here because they don't want to be counted. There are individuals here that come here to be under the radar. Hmm. And they're not going to be coming to any kind of count because they don't want to be counted, and that's why they're here. You not everybody. You can never paint. I used to work at a homeless agency for 10 years, so this is not someone without a background, uh, background okay. in the situation. Um, there's addiction issues. There's mental health issues. Um, but there are also individuals who come here to be under the radar because they have a warrant in another county, mm. because they have child support in another state. Uh, and I've also been a part of an organization that would actually ship people back because their family members have been looking for them. Oh, wow. So um, it's a complex issue. But again, when we start about what we want to do that are part of our shared values and start from there, then we can have debates about things that are, that are splinter issues that are going to be issues no matter what city you're in. What do you think about the stocking economy? What do you think we could do to... I mean, we have... Uh, one of the largest inland ports. Yeah. We have an intermodal train station off of Charter Way. Mm -hmm. My dad used to work there. <laughs> uh, we have uh, interstate, three interstate highways. 
i5, 99, and 88. And we also have uh, an airport, mm -hmm. which could be expanded and developed. How do we utilize those tools to help bolster our economy instead of being the bedroom for the Bay Area? Um, one is that we've never really done a comprehensive assessment of our assets. When we do that, we'll find out where each player, every stakeholder lies. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know. You mentioned the port. We don't make a cent, or we make very little income from the port. The port is actually separate from the city of Stockton. Really? Yeah. So the billions of dollars that they bring in, Stockton does not benefit to a great degree because of it. We can say that they're the port of Stockton, but it's a separate municipality than Stockton. Interesting, because I would think that we could do something where we could start We importing. could if the citizens knew what I just told you. Well, I didn't know that. I thought it was, you know, why are we not collecting tax dollars from the board? And if citizens asked that question collectively to those in power, you would see a different kind of conversation. So, because I can imagine millions of dollars come through I the port. I would say billions. Billions of dollars come through the port. So how did that? That's interesting. We should. Uh, so we should have another conversation around that. We can have as many conversations as you like. This is your show. <laughs> You're going to be an attorney back, uh, back again. Here's Ben. Yeah. Um, I think we should do that. I think we should pick a topic and uh, like hone in on it and just focus. Like and that's why on. part of what I want to do with One City Stockton is begin to have conversations offline and have people who know. Uh, more than I do, more than we do, and it's part of those conversations. I like that because we could start the conversation here and say, "Hey, if you want to have more or know more about this? We're gonna be here. Let's let's start start being uh, honest. You can call it being humble, but just being honest. Like, here's what I don't know about Stockton, and I've yeah. I've had those conversations where I say, "Here's what I don't know. Please educate me," and I've been blown away. But what I've learned, when you ask that question to the right person, mm -hmm. it's been amazing. It's, been, it's When you're vulnerable, people tend to open up and help you. But when you, you use like those you know, tools, when you act like you know everything, people are just like... When you, come, when, you come across somebody, <laughs> when you come across somebody who knows more than you, the best thing to do is ask questions and listen, not try to say, this is what I'm trying to get, get across to you. Okay. And it would serve a lot of people well to do that. And that's why... Uh, you talked about how we connected on Facebook. Uh, I post a lot on my uh, personal page, but mm -hmm. I also post a lot on Stockton's politics page. And it's really just to inform people who want to be yeah, I've noticed, and that's kind of where I, I met you, is just you know reading your posts. I'm like, man, this guy's he, he kind of knows what he's talking about. <laughs> At least online he sounds intelligent. <laughs> right. But it's, keep in mind, I'm, I'm using other people's I put other people's quotes on. Uh, so how, uh, how smart can I be if I'm right. using other people's quotes? It's smart. Be like, I'm curating other people's <laughs> words. That's right. It's what they say, curate. <laughs> so that, that's how we got connected. I was like, yeah. hey, you know, I like what you're doing. I had an opening and you had time. So I Like I said, if, I think it, everybody should do their part. But it's based on who they are. Mm -hmm. And so... Going back to the um, the economy, yeah. how do we start that conversation? What's it look like and how do we... Because we have all these good things about Stockton mm -hmm. and we have all this unused land around us. Mm -hmm. We could do something. 511, they just went in uh, off of uh, Beyond Charter Way Airport. Mm -hmm. So and I think we have an Amazon, yes. a small hub here. Mm -hmm. So we, I think we need to try to continue that in some way and start the conversation. My, my phrase is uh, engage citizens partnering with an open government to addressing the challenges of the city. Well, I think that's As part one of the city. There. We don't have... Uh, and that's a mouthful right there. Like, we don't really have an open government right now. So we have on the left hand, we have citizens who desire to be engaged who don't have the information. Mm -hmm. We have a government who claims to be open but how can you even evaluate that if you don't even know what an go open government looks like? Speaking of open government, we were having a conversation, I can't really quite, around um, Proposition A, was it A or something? From the last election? No. We were talking measure about- Measure A. Measure A. Yes. Measure A. 
How long has that place been? How long has that measure been? Measure, I believe, was approved in 2012. Okay. And so it's been going for six years, mm -hmm. and it brings in approximately $30 million a year. It's a tax, uh, sales tax for Stocktonians. It brings in approximately $30 million a year. And there has been no audit of that in six years? No, nope, there's been reports. Okay. There's been no audit. There needs to be an audit. An independent audit. Um, there has been um, citizens, engaged citizens, who have asked for it. There's one citizen actually sued the city to get the information, and that's still in litigation. I want that guy on my show. If, Ned know. Leba is his name. Um, he's always at every Measure A committee meeting. He's always asking questions. He actually used to be on the committee. And um, I know at least one other committee member uh, resigned out of frustration about not getting answers to questions. Wow. And so, but it is different to have one citizen asking questions versus 1,000. 10,000. 10,000. There's 300,000 people. 300,000 people. Uh, a lot of people listening to us will know what um, the Safe Swenson movement has done. It brought some transparency and answerability from the government. Um, but that was, again, that was the recipe. That was people coming together and saying, we want to make sure we are at the table and we are a part of the conversation. That was a hot topic. Yeah. And so and it's still going on with Van Buskirk as well. And so when you talk about those kind of situations, uh, I've been very encouraged by what people coming together have done uh, when they come together like that. And there's other ones that are doing that now. Uh, there's other neighborhood improvements and organization clubs that are focusing on that. And the more those things happen and the more wider in the city that they become, the more you will see open government to engage citizens. I think that's important. I mean, start, I mean, for me, I live in the Swinson area. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, if we would have created low-income housing, it would have ruined our economy because there's no jobs here right I mean most of the people who would come here would first whoever could pay the most rent mm -hmm. would get the place right. so I think we would get a huge influx of Bay Area people like we've because we've had that cycle a couple times uh, 2000 to 2006 mm -hmm. before the uh, market crash we had tons of Bay Area people mm -hmm. come flooding the area pushing prices up yeah. And now we're we're having the the Bay Area push up rent prices, mm -hmm. and I I'm, part of it I think is part of the Bay Area pressure, but also the economy is doing better, mm -hmm. and people are I think they're kind of misdirecting some of their anger at the Bay Area people when it's just a natural part of the economy that things are prices are inflation prices right. are rising, rents are rising. This is different realities. Uh, I was part of a marketing study. I participated in a marketing study for the city of Stockton. And I was there for the uh, report. And the, the results were that part of the reason why Stockton is not informed is because there's no local uh, TV station that's here. Mm. We have Channel 10, Channel 13, I think Fox 40. They're based in Sacramento. They have a bureau. They have reporters that are here. And so when you have that center of gravity being Sacramento, most of the time, in order to take away airtime from all the other areas around Sacramento, it's going to usually be bad news, they report. Right. You can't say, like, Stockton is, you know, this and that, and it's a good news, and beat out tragedy somewhere else. And so when you have someone from Sacramento making those editorial calls, you will have them saying, well, if there's a shooting in Stockton, hey, let's put that on. Yeah, bad news, let's front, go. You know, first, first story. So um, I love the voice. Uh, there's about uh, maybe two locally owned, I think, radio stations here. No locally owned, you know, uh, big name mm -hmm. uh, TV stations. So they were saying in the report that, you know, uh, as far as it comes to publicity, you've got to lead, have a lead story type news. And usually that's negative if this, you know, if the station was based in Stockton then you have editorial perspective that would come from Stockton. Mm -hmm. You'd makes... be able to report positive news. Okay. Another study that happened, and these are studies that the city does and pays money for, um, 
The other marketing study, they said that when they did a survey of other cities about Stockton, mm -hmm. as well as Stockton, they said the most negative publicity by word of mouth about Stockton were from people that lived in Stockton, even more so than people outside of Stockton. Wow. Now, you can, you know, go on your tangents on, on as to why, but the main reason is because there is the communication, the connectivity, and the information is lacking. And in, so if we were as an engaged citizen, we fix that? Well, What's that look like? I mean, it, lo it looks you're, like you're, you're, you're asking questions. I'm going to give you answers. <laughs> it looks, what it looks like is we have to ask ourselves, what are the sources of our information that we receive? And mm. how are they rating to what we want from them? Uh, let me put it this way. The city has a website. The city has a person whose job is to give public information, public information officer. The city has a TV station. It does? Channel 97. That's where the city council meetings okay. are broadcast on. So they have outlets at their disposal that are city owned. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, are they providing service to us as citizens okay. that we need. So I'll, I'm not going to answer that question on the air. <laughs> I'm going to say that question should be asked. So Channel 97 only broadcasts city council meetings? City events. Okay. It could be any city event. It's a, a city station. I didn't even know they existed. Interesting. I guess I don't... Because right now you're doing active listening. You know? <laughs> yeah. I don't have cable. I think it's a, probably a cable channel, right? Or is it it's also online as well. Okay. Like, there's a link on the city website that you can actually list and watch city council meetings on it. Okay. Interesting. You learn something new every day. You said that before. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I learned a lot, I learned learned a lot today. Man. <laughs> I love it. So, let's dive into another hot topic. Let's dive in. I'm ready. Mayor Tubbs. Yes. So, good, bad, indifferent. What, what, do, you, what do you think he could do to make Stockton great again? Well, let's first off, let me start by saying I love Mayor Tubbs. I've known him most of his life. Um, it may embarrass him a little bit, but he used to, um, he, <laughs> he used to recite scripture. He used to attend the same church. He okay. would recite scripture, and he would just be, he loved spoken word. So uh, he was, uh, I remember him as, as a younger man. Uh, and so I kind of always kind of see him that way as the, the kid brother type, uh -huh. type situation. Um I appreciate his position as mayor. I appreciate uh, what he is uh, trying to do. Um, I would say that uh, I was very impressed, uh, and this is, should be online somewhere, um, but he actually wrote out a political platform uh, when he was running for mayor. It was beautiful. Uh, it kind of touched all the bases of what we're talking about. Um, Having said all that, it's very difficult to be the mayor of all of Stockton. It's difficult to navigate uh, the expectations of everybody. Yeah, because you're not going to make everybody happy. No. And I know he made a lot of people mad with the whole Swenson thing. He did. And what I will say is that um, I have a lot of respect for the uh, position he's in. Um, his grandmother still goes to my church, so she'll pull <laughs> me aside and, and so I, I'll tell you what I told her. <laughs> All right. I said, I don't always agree with what your grandson does. I said, but I love your grandson. And uh, if we've got to be in an environment in this city to be able to disagree with somebody and not be seen as a hater, yeah, not be seen as someone who is against somebody. Just I pray for him. Sense. I'm for him. I don't always agree with things he's done. And yes, I criticize him and I say things critical of him to anybody who will ask me, including him. It doesn't mean you you don't like him or hate him or you want to I see him I am not fail. on the I hate the mayor tip. I'm not on the I hate the mayor train. Sometimes you have you have to have those friends in your life that tell you like, "Hey man, you you're screwing up. You yeah. need, you need to Yeah. You need to get back on track here." Yeah. Or, and I will um I did not support the recall Mayor Tubbs movement. I respect what they did, 
I think they but, should have the opportunity to do so. I know people were part of that movement. Some people had good motivation for doing it. Some people did not, and they all got kind of clumped together. And they didn't have a unified message. So you listen to them on TV, they all were saying something different. And the ones that I know, I tried to advise. And I was saying, you know, focus your message, and it's not personal. And that's probably the trickiest thing about politics, is that it, Keep it. as much as you think it's personal, it can't be made personal. Once you make it personal on the giving or receiving end of that, it doesn't do anybody any good. Yeah, then it's just a free-for-all. No so a politician, and I'll be honest with you, anybody who I know and I love and I care for, when they ask me, should they run for office, I tell them no. <laughs> Every single one of them. And why is that? Why do you think that is? I mean, because on the one side, we need good politicians. But on the other side, what is your reasoning for not? My reasoning for that is simple. I think that everybody that has asked me, including myself, I've been asked to run for office. And the answer I give is thank you, but no thank you. And the reasoning being is that, number one, I believe compromise is a prerequisite for politics. Mm. Very deep right there. This is just for me. No, I'm but just you speaking made, on behalf of me. That's a good me. point. I was approached, I, I, people asked, I mean, I wasn't approached, well, I've been approached one to, a few times, but three people asked me the other day, when, in one day, mm -hmm. when am I running for mayor? And yeah. I was just like, I don't know, I don't know, man, This is, that's kind of scary. There's a lot of people that are approached, whether it's mayor or the city council, a lot of people are approached. And that's when I had to realize, like, we, we are good people. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody asks is a good person, but to think that you're one of the few that are asked is is not accurate. True, a lot of people are asked. You just like wow. Me? So when I when I when I was asked, I just said uh, thank you, but no thank you. Uh, number one, proper compromise prerequisite. Yeah. Number two, I'm not interested in losing my own individual voice. Most politicians have to consider what four or five different people groups think of what they would say when their a microphone's in their face in front of, you know, yeah, so a they camera have, or that's media. That's why they don't never... You gotta develop it. You gotta have at least one more face. Yeah. Sometimes four <laughs> or five faces. Well, because they always talk around the subject and never give you a direct answer. Right. I can own my voice. I can own my perspective, my opinion, and it's mine. And I don't have to worry about what... I'm going to lose some votes by, you know, or consensus by, by saying something else. Do you think it's possible to just stick to your voice and, and run and win? Uh, not totally, which goes back to the main reason. It goes back to the, the blog I started, the pages I started, One City Stockton, is um, if you were to look at the org chart for uh, the city of Stockton, you'll see city staff, you will see department heads, you will see uh, mayor, city council, and then I think below city council is city manager. But the very top box is a box with the word citizen in it. Which means a citizen is the boss of everything underneath. That's pretty powerful. And I, I think it's a better journey for me and a better aspiration for me to help citizens realize their power as citizens, as another citizen, than to run for office and tell the same thing where I, I, I won't win everybody over because I've now become part of the establishment. Right. And in order to keep an open government open, you've got to hold them accountable. And I have three phrases I use. As answerability, accountability, and transparency. transparency. Thank you. You were paying attention last <laughs> night. It's we right talked here. on the phone last night. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, um, out of when I after reflecting on ten years and having a one year to reflect on it, I feel like the best thing position for me to make an impact is to go that route. Pretty powerful. Anybody who asks me if I actually obviously I love myself. So anybody who I love, they ask me, and I've had people invite me for coffee and. Feel the calling. I feel that you know. I feel it's like well, get past the feeling. Because you're gonna be, a, you're gonna have a target on your back. Because you can be the person pushing that person you want to be. Mm -hmm. And I'd much rather be the person 
uh, pushing from behind and underneath and around and, and uh, making sure people that are in office don't forget me because uh, every person in office has to consider their financial supporters. I'm not saying they do everything they, 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 they're told, but they have to consider that as a possibility and dynamic when they make choices. True. I don't want even, you know, I resist doing sales jobs. I don't want to know how low I will go for a sale. I don't want to know the answer to that. Hmm. I was just talking to a, a buddy who I hadn't talked to in, in years, and he would he was a, a broker, mm -hmm. insurance broker, and mm -hmm. he would get $300 broker fees mm -hmm. left and right, just yeah. cracking them. And he was telling me yesterday, it was like, you know, I started using, trying to numb myself, and mm -hmm. I feel that it's because I was doing wrong by people mm -hmm. instead of giving, giving them right. the best deal I could. Right. I was being their friend and taking advantage of them and charge them $300 broker fees. And it, it was uh, an internal destruction. He started down the path of using drugs mm -hmm. and, and alcohol and, and he figured it out that, and he, he's, I'm assuming he's pretty much back to normal. Mm -hmm. and so we're gonna have coffee and you know, see, just based on the the superficial conversation we had, he was like, my narcissism was you know killing me, mm -hmm. and I was like, ah, oh, that's pretty powerful. You you could even see yourself as that person, right? So I could see when you're in the political realm, you have to like, I don't know, the groupie or or whoever's backing you. You have to consider what they're going to say when you vote against what they wanted you to vote. If for. someone gives you five, ten, twenty thousand dollars, you can't dismiss them yeah. when they ask you, "What are your thoughts on this vote?" Or, and again, Ben, I want you to vote this way. And again, I don't want to even be Here's in that. And I, I don't even be in, in that room. Yeah. You know, if I'm going to be in that room, I'm be in that room owning my own voice. That's tough. And mm. having the power of no. Mm. You have to compromise. You may have to compromise yourself. You're going to compromise one way or the other. It, and most of the time, it's like little things. But And then by the time you realize it. And when it comes to politics, That's when you bring you're always going to be surrounded by people who know more than you about what you're doing. There's a guy, his name is Darren Brown. He's a hypnotist or a mentalist. And he's gotten people to start with those small compromises. And then by the end of the show, they're throwing a person off the building yeah yeah i'm just like i gotta see that i was watching i was listening to an interview yeah uh yesterday uh, with him it's very very subtle and i have a healthy respect for the political system i'll call it the political industrial complex okay and chances are i would have been sucked in the same way like everybody else those that have i'm not presuming everybody has right but those that have i don't consider myself being immune from that you know, how would you inoculate yourself against something like that? It's difficult. Uh, I know what I would do, and this is by no means me dropping a hint about eventually running for office. You would have to have your own money. That would be one way, because then you would be. What I would, the first thing I would do is I would gather people that tell me things I don't want to hear, but I know are true. Those are tough to listen to sometimes. Yeah. But those I would, are your, those I would, are your I would surround myself with people, and I would just regularly sur uh, sur uh, sur uh, submerse myself in a council of people who care more about me than what I'm doing. The proverbial boxing ring with all your friends like beating you up. The like, gauntlet. <laughs> yeah. And the best <laughs> run through the gauntlet. The best <laughs> example of that is uh, there's a book called Team of Rivals written by Dolores Kearns Goodwin. It's about Abraham Lincoln. Mm. Abraham Lincoln uh, brought in his fiercest critics and would bounce ideas off them. He just and they let them rip apart, rip it apart. And he would take their uh, their criticisms into consideration before he made a final decision. That's pretty powerful. But it takes a, 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 a unique kind of politician to do that. Very deep. 
we got a few minutes left here. So That's it, man. I'm yeah, I know, man. man. Ever. <laughs> it's like, like I feel like we can have a three-hour show, we man. Could. So, uh, what else would you want the people of Stockton to know as we wrap this up? What, what do you? What's your? What's your? Other than message? One City Stockton on Facebook there and One go. City Stockton on Twitter. <laughs> And once he stopped in the blog, which I made my first post on my Facebook page. I'll have to tag it in here. <laughs> um, like I said, I'd like for this to become a conversation offline. So if you hear about a conversation with, with Benjamin Saffold or One City Stockton, if you hear about it, uh, you see it posted on Facebook or something, come on out. I want to have a conversation with all hands on deck. I believe it's a place for everybody in the conversation. I like that. Can't, do you have one plan in the future? Not yet. Not yet. Because you and I are going to have a conversation after this show. <laughs> right. So there may be a future announcement on this show. Okay. I like it. I like about, it. It depends if I like you or not. <laughs> I ain't going to commit. You know, it's a public forum. Yeah, so. right. Yeah. You're well, being political right well, now. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'll ask. Right. I'll, we'll have a conversation. Then we'll see what comes after that. All right. Sounds good. But yeah, I'm on Facebook. Uh, all my... Benjamin Saffold, at Benjamin Saffold, at all the social media. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm, you know. One City Stockton. One City Stockton, Twitter, Facebook. No, there's no website, just okay. just social media. Okay. But where's your blog? Where do people find blog, it? Blog, BenjaminSaffold.blogspot.com. Okay. There you go. I feel like I say anymore, we're going to go into another conversation. Yeah, I know. I'm going to bring it in. <laughs> thank you, Don't brother, for coming in. My pleasure. Thanks hey, for the invite. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Tonight, I'm hosting a mixer at Central from 6 to 8. Bring a guest, free food, first come, first serve. It's a business mixer, so bring your cards. Or if you just want, or you, maybe you're looking for a job, there's going to be 30 or 40 different business owners there. So come by, say hi, and... Uh, Talk to you soon, and remember, yes you can, well, that's we can. <laughs>